1986, Robert Fulgham wrote a bestseller entitled, All I Really Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. I've compiled some of his observations and added a few others to compose this top ten list, the top ten life lessons we learned in kindergarten. First one is, milk and cookies make the day more tolerable. Pathetically, that's still true in my life. (laughs) We also learned in kindergarten the value of taking a nap every afternoon. That's starting to come back to me as a more valuable life lesson. We learned in kindergarten to clean up your own mess. That's good advice for all of us, isn't it? We learned in kindergarten to laugh and sing and dance and finger paint because there's more to life than work. We also learned in kindergarten that like Play-Doh, not everything that smells good should be eaten. You could probably add paste to that list. (laughs) And we learned when you go out in the world, hold hands and stick together. Sound advice. We learned in kindergarten that everyone needs a recess once in a while. And we learned it's wise to open our ears and close our mouth and That's advice that I need to take and probably also all of us. We also learned in kindergarten that we need more eraser than pencil. I'd ask for a show of hands how many that still applies to, but I think every hand would probably go up. And we learned in kindergarten that someone bigger than you is in charge, and thank the Lord for that, right? That's a pretty good top ten list of life lessons, isn't it? How much better life would be if we all lived by them? It made me wonder what kind of list we would come up with if we asked the question, what are the top ten things we've learned in Sunday school? Maybe we would begin by quoting the Ten Commandments. How much better life would be if we lived by that list, right? After thousands of years... The Ten Commandments are still relevant to our lives. A Gallup poll conducted about eight years ago asked that question and found that 80% of Americans, I'm sorry, 86% of Americans accept the Ten Commandments as relevant for our lives today. However, a couple of years later, a Kelton research study revealed that while 80% of Americans know that Two all-beef patties are a part of the ingredients of a Big Mac. Only 60% knew that thou shalt not kill was one of the Ten Commandments. I would imagine that that would be the one that people would be the most familiar with and most associate with the Ten Commandments. That tells us something about our literacy rate of the Bible, perhaps, and our knowledge of God's Ten Commandments. I I perceive that most of us can recite most of the Ten Commandments. We would be especially good at Numbers 5 through 10, right? Honor your father and mother. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not commit adultery. Do not covet. And most of us could probably recite Numbers 3 and 4. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. And remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. But we're a little fuzzy on Numbers 1 and 2. They sound too similar for us to distinguish between the two of them. That's complicated because there is a Catholic version of the first two commandments and a Protestant version of the first two commandments. And while they are very similar, they are different. And so we're a little confused about the difference between uh, commandment number one and commandment number two. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, and thou shalt not bow down to or create any graven images or any idols. But I think those two commandments are the most relevant of all. They are foundational to the rest of the commandments. They are the reason that we keep the rest of the commandments because he is God. We are beginning today a series of sermons that will last through the summer and it will be an expression of those first two commandments. I've entitled this series of sermons, No Other Gods, and we will explore the gods that we are tempted to follow. This morning, we're going to take a close look at that first commandment and learn from it to worship the one true God. Let's look at Exodus 20, verses 1 through 3. And God spoke all these words. 
I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Worship the one true God, for he is a good God. He is a God of deliverance. He is a savior. He is a rescuer. He delivered Israel. They were enslaved in Egypt for a period of about 400 years, and the Egyptians were brutal slave masters to the Jewish people, forcing them into labor at the end of a whip. The Jews were forced into labor to build great cities, to build some of the pyramids. Have you ever wondered how they managed to get those huge stones on top of one another at an ever-increasing height? Without the aid of some of the power equipment that we have available today, it was because of thousands of men pushing and pulling huge stones up ramps and manipulating them into the place and most of that much of that at least was done by the Jewish slaves that lived in Egypt the first couple of chapters of Exodus describe their living conditions with these adjectives oppressed, worked ruthlessly, suffering misery The Egyptians were cruel taskmasters, and they practiced a cruel and callous form of birth control. When the Jewish people began to grow in their population, and the Egyptians felt threatened by this increasing number of slaves in their nation, they enlisted uh, uh, midwives to put to death any male child born to a Jewish mother. That child was thrown into the Nile River to be eaten by the crocodiles that lived there. What a terrible fate. God's people suffered. They cried out to God for help, and God delivered them, for he is a good God. And hasn't God likewise delivered us? Maybe some of the adjectives that could be used to describe your life at times include suffering and misery. Maybe you've been forced to endure ruthless conditions. Maybe you have suffered some cruel fate, and you cried out to God, and he heard your prayers, and he came to your aid and delivered you. And we have been able to live blessed lives because he is a good God. And he has brought us, too, out of slavery. He has brought us out of the slavery to sin. Ephesians 5, 8 reminds us, Once you were full of darkness, but now you, have, you are light from the Lord. You have light from the Lord within you. We are changed. We have hope. We have brightness in our life. No longer is it darkened by sin or threatened by spiritual oppression. In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11, the Apostle Paul cites some of what that which we have been delivered from. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have been set free. And we no longer live in fear of eternal suffering or spiritual oppression because our God is a good God. He is a God of deliverance. He is a God of benevolence. One of our favorite verses to quote is found in Romans 8. It's verse 28, which says, We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. That's only because he is a God of generosity of spirit. He is a God of goodwill, and he desires to shower blessings upon his people. He is a God of benevolence. Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. 80% of its population lives in absolute 
poverty. It has a 60% unemployment rate. It has lost nearly all of its forests due to exploitation of those resources. And as a result, much of its topsoil has eroded away, never to be replaced. It has also lost many other of its natural resources, depleted through exploitation and government corruption. The primary formally declared religion in Haiti is Catholicism. But most of the Catholic people there practice voodoo also, a religion whose gods are derived from the West African beliefs of that island's ancestors. Voodoo is so widely practiced in Haiti that it has been called the unofficial national religion of Haiti. That nation has experienced terrible suffering as a result of continuing violence and government corruption and destitution. But it needn't have turned out that way. In the 18th century, under French rule, Haiti was one of the richest islands in the French Empire. France ruled that nation island wisely. But the Haitians revolted against the French in the late 18th century, and voodoo played an important part in that revolution. The rebellion was inspired by a call to reject the Christian God and to embrace the gods of voodoo. And slaves ripped the crosses from off of their necks and attacked plantation owners. Unsubstantiated reports exist that those slaves prayed to Satan, promising that if he would deliver them from French control, their nation would worship and honor him. Haitian Christians today see that as a spiritual turning point of the nation, the time when Haiti rejected God and adopted a satanic religion. For many decades thereafter, voodoo was the primary religion of that newly independent nation, and it is still a primary influence there. About seven years ago, my wife Holly took a mission trip to Haiti. She worked with the Christian orphanage directed by a lady there from the, who grew up in one of the churches in Tuscarora's County. Holly said that she witnessed a nightly parade of voodoo practitioners past the orphanage and past the director's house. They would stop in the street in front of those buildings and chant and challenge the Christians. It was a form of demonic intimidation. Haiti has a dark soul. Voodoo has become a way of life in that nation. Francois Duvalier, the Haitian president in the 1960s, and his son, who led that nation in the 70s and 80s, used the fear of voodoo to control its people. They claimed that the presidential troops had been raised from the dead. In other words, that they were zombies who could not be killed in order to instill fear within the people. And they used their positions of power to siphon off for themselves millions of dollars from the Haitian economy and from foreign aid meant to bring relief to the Haitian people who were suffering. Fear, oppression, debilitating poverty, and ceaseless killing have haunted the Haitians as their reward for serving that other God. Satan has exacted much from them, but has given little in return. Let's compare that island nation of Haiti with its neighbor, the Dominican Republic. The two nations border each other. In fact, they share the same island. When you cross the border out of Haiti into the Dominican Republic, you immediately are met with lush green forests. The Dominican Republic has many natural resources which contribute to that nation's wealth. It has a stable government which which protects and provides for its people instead of exploiting them. That nation has the wealthiest economy in the Caribbean and Central America. 
In fact, for the last 25 years, the Dominican Republic has boasted the fastest growing economy in the Western Hemisphere. Its unemployment rate is 83% lower than that of Haiti. It has good schools, good health care facilities, and most of the modern conveniences we enjoy in our nation. Christianity is the official and most popular religion of the Dominican Republic. In fact, the church is supported in part through government funding in that nation. Voodoo is not accepted there. That nation enjoys the goodness of the one true God it recognizes and worships. Our God is a good God. He is a God of grace and mercy and love. He is a God of blessing and benevolence. A God who reminds us, I brought you out of slavery. A God who calls us, therefore, to worship him. Worship him because he is a good God. And worship him for he is God alone. Let's go back to verses 2 and 3 of our text this morning. When God said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Let's leave that screen up for just a few moments, if you will, Heather. There are no other gods, is what these verses are telling us. Note the capital G in reference to the one true God and the lowercase g in reference to all others. That was intentional to teach us that he alone is the one true God. And so when he calls out, have no other gods before me, you might notice that I've placed an asterisk there and maybe you wondered why. It's because the NIV footnote, as we will see in the next slide, indicates that the word before could also be translated and probably should be translated besides. God's not saying, have no other gods in front of me. He's saying, have no other gods except me. He's not demanding to be first among many. He insists that he is the one and only. And all others are small case G gods. They are not God at all. The nation of Israel continually lived under the influence of other gods. Egypt, the nation Israel had escaped just three months prior to Moses receiving these Ten Commandments, was polytheistic, meaning that its people worshipped many gods. There was Ra and Isis and Horus and Osiris and Anubis and many others as well. But they were powerless gods. They were powerless to relieve the suffering of the people who worshipped them. They took from the people in the form of sacrifice, but they gave nothing in return. God told Israel, I delivered you from that. Canaan, the land that God was leading Israel to, was also polytheistic. They worshipped gods such as Baal and Asherah and Moloch and others. They were immoral gods which employed temple prostitutes for their religious rituals. And they were demanding gods which required the worshippers to make child sacrifice to them. They took from the people but gave nothing in return. And God would deliver his people from that. We too live under the influence of other gods. And God's message to these Jewish people who received it originally is the same as his message to us today. Worship no other gods. There are many gods in America. A god can be defined as anything which takes the place of the one true God in our life. In other words, whatever you love the most, whatever you serve the most, whatever you seek out most, whatever you give to the most, whatever you care about the most, that is your God. 
Your God can be your career. Your God can be your bank account. Your God can be some status that you hope to achieve. It can be a position of influence that you desire at your place of employment. It can be a power that you crave. It can be the goals and aspirations that drive you or a pleasure that you pursue. Martin Luther said, whatever we make the most of is our God. You see what we desire, what we treasure, what we love the most determines what we will worship, what we will serve. How can we identify what that is so that we might be aware of it? Here are a few clues. Examine how you spend your non-working time. Examine how you spend your discretionary money. Examine what stirs your heart the most. And then ask yourself, is God more valuable to me than those things? Will I sacrifice those things in order to serve God and to worship Him? Or am I more likely to sacrifice time with God in order to enjoy those things? There is only one God, one true God, and He demands our time and our worship and our service. In Isaiah chapter 46, the prophet called his people out of idolatry. Let's look at what he said in verses 1 and 2. Bel has bowed down, Nebo stoops over. Let's pause right there. Bel and Nebo were Babylonian gods. Bel has bowed down, Nebo stoops over. Their images are consigned to beasts and the cattle. The things that you carry are burdensome. A load for the weary. They stooped over. They have bowed down together. They could not rescue the burden, but have themselves gone into captivity. What this is telling us is that your gods are gods you have to carry around. You have to put them on a horse cart or an oxen cart to be transported from one place to another because those gods cannot transport themselves. They are a burden to you. And when you need them the most, they cannot come through for you. They're not there to save you. They are not there to help you. Those gods of Babylon were powerless. In contrast to that, God identified himself to his wayward people with these words in verses 3 and 4. Listen to me, you descendants of Jacob, all the remnant of the people of Israel, you whom I have upheld since your birth and have carried since you were born, even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. It was he who always carried them. He would sustain his people and rescue his people always. The gods we sometimes serve are powerless to provide what we really need. Oh, they may give some temporary sense of satisfaction, but they cannot sustain us and they will not save us. In fact, it's more likely that the opposite is true. In his book entitled The Wounded Healer, Henri Nguyen retells a legend from ancient India. It goes like this. Four royal brothers each decided to master a special ability. Time went by and the brothers met to reveal what they had learned. I have mastered a science, said the first, by which I can take the bone of some creature and create the flesh that goes with it. The second said, I know how to grow that creature's skin and hair if there is flesh on its bones. The third added, I am able to create its limbs if I have the flesh and the skin and the hair. And the fourth added, I know how to give life to that creature if its form is complete. 
The brothers then went into the jungle to find a bone so that they could demonstrate their specialties. As fate would have it, the bone they found was that of a lion. One added flesh to the bone. The second added hide and hair. The third completed it with matching limbs. And the fourth gave the lion life. Shaking its mane, the ferocious beast arose and jumped on its creators and killed them all. And the moral of that story is this. We have the ability to create what can devour us. Our goals and dreams can consume our time and energy. Our possessions can captivate us and replace more noble priorities. Our desires can lead us down the wrong path. Our other gods can destroy us. Jesus, knowing that, offered a solution with these simple words when he said, Seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. Serve him above all else, for he alone is God. Give him the worship and the time and the energy of your life. Give him your whole life. And to that he calls you this morning. If you've never made a commitment like that to God as your God, to Jesus as your Savior, he invites you to do so this morning.